Welcome to the Master Your Mix podcast, helping engineers, producers, and artists create professional recordings and mixes, even from home. I'm your host, Mike and Davina. Let's get started. Hey, welcome to the Master Mix Podcast. My name is Mike Navina, and thank you so much for being here today. Today, my guest is Jeff Daking. Jeff got his start in the 60s, starting as the drummer for a band called the Blues Magoos. And then over the years into the 70s, he became an engineer working in New York, working on some amazing records, including Meatloaf's Bat Out of Hell, which is obviously a massive record. And over the years, Jeff's engineering skills grew and grew, and his technical knowledge grew as well. And he started to eventually get into building his own gear, and he started up a company called Daking Audio which builds amazing microphone preamps, EQs, compressors, and consoles. And in this interview, we get into a lot of conversation about choosing the right gear, understanding what goes into your equipment, and understanding what makes something good versus bad, and what kind of things you should be looking out for when you're making decisions in terms of either purchasing or choosing which equipment you're going to use in a session. And in this interview, we definitely get into a little bit of some technical lingo, but it's really important and it's very clear that Jeff really understands the technical knowledge of all this stuff. Clearly, he understands what goes into the design of these tools. And ultimately, that's what you want when you're buying gear made by someone, right? You want to know that somebody has built this with an engineer in mind, as opposed to just putting together a bunch of parts. And uh, I think as you'll hear in this interview, that is exactly who Jeff is. And he has a very specific goal with all of his products that we get into very early on in this conversation. So let's not waste any more time. Let's just jump right into the interview. This is Jeff Daking on the Master Mix podcast. Jeff Daking, thank you so much for being on the Master Mix podcast. How are you doing? Good. Thanks for having me. No problem. For people who might not know your history, how you got into music, how you got to ultimately where you are today, can you give us that story? Well, I went to New York when I was 18. I was uh, 1966. I was in a band called Blues Magoos. We had a label on a, a deal with a label, Mercury. And uh, I did that for four years. We had a few records, went on a few tours. But then in 1970, I went into the, got a job in a recording studio. I was interested in recording. So I was a full-time recording engineer from 1970 to 1998 in New York. And I did all sorts of records and film scores and jingles and other nonsense that most people wouldn't believe. It was funny because most of those uh, first 10 years, I was a studio staff engineer, which, no, of course, nobody even knows what that is any longer. You know, in, in those days, you, had, you went to a specific studio for the sound, and that was partly the sound of the studio and partly the sound of the engineers that worked there. And so I did that for, uh, you know, from 1970 to about 1980. What got you into recording in the first place? Uh, working on these records in the Blues Magoos. We did, you know, I just sat in the control room the whole time and was fascinated by the by the uh, process. And then by the third album, we were actually doing some of the recording at home. Gotcha. On a, on a little console with a Scully four track. Was the idea to get into recording so that you could eventually record your own material? Or was it just like something that interested you enough that you maybe wanted to separate that from your band and, and do the engineering thing on its own? Yes, that's what B. B. Okay. <laughs> Answer B. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I, cause I know so many musicians get into it cause they, they have the same experience as you where they get in the studio, they see all the stuff. They, they you know, it seems like such a attractive industry to be in and whatever, and, but they want to do it for themselves or for their own music. So it's, it's refreshing to hear people that have g gone into it thinking that they want to do it for others and, and focus on doing that instead. It was, uh, uh, much more exciting doing it for others. You know, having, of course, this is New York City in the 70s, so you had the most amazing pool of talent working there. Very true. And uh, in insane pool of talent, so. Yeah. And so how did you learn? Did you, like, when you first got into the studios, were you, you, you mentioned that you were a staff engineer, but before that, were you, like, interning at all? Like, how, how did you eventually, like, learn the, the material? I lied. <laughs> Classic story. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, I, I knew quite a bit from um, from making the records in the blues, because I learned a bunch. And then I, I had this harebrained idea in 1969 that I wanted to uh, uh, borrow, you know, get somebody to invest in a studio and build a studio in Woodstock, New York. What a crazy idea. So anyway, that never got going. But I went to the first, my first AES show was in 1969. 
where I met these guys with this little company called API. And they had this console there. And I thought that was going to be perfect for what I wanted to do. So I went out to Long Island and I met those guys and they gave me a set of block diagrams. And I learned the block diagram of that API inside out. And then uh, later, I said, well, I'd love to see where that console went. And they said, well, it went to a place called Sound Ideas in, on Broadway. So I went down to Sound Ideas, and it had been pretty sleepy there. But for whatever reason, they were jammed that week. And the guy, it was a sole owner, a guy named George Clavin, and he was busy as hell. And so he said, you want a job? I went, sure. But uh, Right place at the right time, I guess, right? Yeah, but that's always that way in this business. So I used to have a customer a black guy named Maurice Irby. And he wrote, so he wrote that song, Apple Peaches, Pumpkin Pie, and a bunch of stuff like that. But he used to say, if you need a job, and there's a job driving a truck, and you don't know how to drive the truck, when you go to get the job, you say to the boss, you know, this truck is a little different than the one I drove last time. Can you show me how it works? <laughs> I love that. That's great. <laughs> so uh, those are words to live by. Never turn down a job that you don't know how to do. Just say, it's a little different than last time. You know, we'll have to figure it out. I absolutely love that story. I got to write that down. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, my very first session was uh, recording the song Up, Up, and Away for the airline TWA with uh, 12 of the most amazing Brazilian mus musicians in New York. You know, I'm talking about Emilio Diodato and Ayrton Moreira and Dom Romeo and all that stuff. You know, whoever the best Brazilian musicians were in New York at the time. And it was like crazy. Yeah. That's awesome. That's amazing. I yeah, I love that story of getting in and just, it, it's, it, I mean, being in New York at that time, obviously, like you said, there was such an amazing pool of talent there. And, and just from, from what I know, like you, you got the ability to work on a ton of amazing records at that time. And I was wondering if you could share some of the stories of some of the records you worked on from back then. Records. Okay. Um, I did a lot of records. Uh, the most famous one was the uh, Meatloaf, Bat Out of Hell, where Todd Rundgren had recorded drums, bass, and guitar. One, one, drums, one bass, and one guitar track up at his little studio in, up near Woodstock. And he brought it down on 16 track. We bumped it up to 24, and then I did everything else. That was an interesting record because, uh, first of all, Todd and I record the same way in that we commit everything to tape. Mm-hmm all the EQ, all the compression, everything that goes on tape is the way you want it to sound on a record. <clears throat> so he didn't have a deal, or they, I guess, uh, what's his name, Steiner was involved. They didn't have a deal for the record. So they were shopping at the record labels. So they wanted to show how organic the record was. So we took the album and we cut it onto two reels, all the masters, and we put like five seconds a liter in between each song, and it was sequenced the way we wanted the album to be. And then they would bring in the guys from Columbia Records and Todd and I would sit down and we would mix the album live from the multi-track. Hmm. And, the, and the next bunch of guys, we did that for a couple, three days. So in the end, when we actually mixed the record, except for Love by the Dashboard Lights, this entire record, you know, 50 million sales in the first couple of years was mixed in an afternoon. Amazing. Yeah, well... We had practiced. Yeah, I guess I guess so, right? No automation. You know. Yeah. So so yeah, that's, that's a really interesting story. So did you, you guys had practiced all your moves and you knew what you were going to do going into that session? I'm assuming. Yeah, we we had done it a couple of three days in a row with these uh, industry clowns. <laughs> that's amazing. That's a great story because I feel like so many people these days hum and haw over their mixes and they'll spend like weeks to finish a mix sometimes and. It's proof right there. It's like just you can get things done quickly and still have it be a, an amazing quality product and, and it'll sell, you know. Well, the thing I loved about doing commercials was you you have a 10 o'clock session. So you get to studio around nine. You've got you've had a setup set in the night before. Your assistant engineer has put out the mics and things that you, you expect to see. And uh, so you have 40 guys in the room. And at 11 o'clock, they're gone. There's no screwing around. You have to get it all, and you might have four, five, six minutes of music on tape. It is no bullshit. You gotta. It's what I call driving a race car. But uh, 
That's what I really liked about it. And of course, you had the most amazing talent. You pick any name that you ever heard in New York City. And uh, those were the guys in the session, you know, Dave Sanborn, Lou Marini, Tom Malone, uh, Steve Gadd, Will Lee, you know, it was like all the famous string players, horn players. It was great. That's amazing. Yeah, definitely. Well, when you're working with caliber musicians, like like musicians of that caliber, it definitely makes the job a lot easier, right? <laughs> yeah. And uh, let's see, the one of the more interesting records I ever did was I, made, I did an album with Lou Reed. Uh, where for whatever reason, Lou didn't want anybody in the studio except him and the engineer. So it was just Lou and me in the studio from seven o'clock at night till about three or four in the morning for months. And then uh, we go to mix this record and then we do the, you know, the rough mixes and we put the wine and cheese party together for Clive Davis and, you know, Arista and all that. Well, this album, which was called Street Hassle, had songs like, I want to be black. I don't want to be a fucked up middle class college student no more. I just want to have a stable of foxy little whores and have a big prick too and be like Martin Luther King and get shot in the spring and fuck up the Jews. Wow. <laughs> you can play it. You can find out it. Oh, it's a long story, but so we do the little wine and cheese party and, and, and Clive and his minions are sitting in front of the console and listen to this. And we, and the whole thing is over and Clive stands up and says, Lou, this album is relentlessly offensive <laughs> and walked out of the room <laughs> and they dropped yeah, really. him from Arista. But you know what? It was my fault. Lou never spoke to me again. Interesting. <laughs> <laughs> so you never even got an explanation as to why it was your no, fault. It was just, no, it wasn't my fault. It, it was something wrong with the noise reduction or something like that. I don't know. But, uh, there is an album one you can find on iTunes called, uh, Street hassle that has that song on there. If you think I may, <laughs> may no, I, I believe you. <laughs> I believe you. I was going to say it's probably it would have been better if he hadn't released that. Out, I'm sure, right? <laughs> uh, probably the most talented guy I think, by and large, I ever worked with with Luther Vandross. Oh wow, yeah, he's a monster. Nice guy, uh, very funny, incredibly talented. He'd come to the studio one week and he'd be 175 pounds and he'd come back three weeks later and he'd be 350 pounds. <laughs> and then he'd come back three weeks later and he'd be 175 pounds. Wow. Well, maybe I'm exaggerating a little yeah, bit. Yeah, of course. Yeah. That's, what, that's what killed him. He had a stroke, you know. But he was a monster. Uh, Donny Hathaway. Uh, weird little recordings. Like when I was working at Sound Mixers in 1977, Sound Mixers was owned by a big company called Sound One. We were ha we had the whole floor of the second floor of the Brill Building, 49th and Broadway. And Sound One had two or three floors upstairs. And so I'm about to go home on a Friday, not much going on. And they go, oh, no, you got to do one more song demo. Okay. So I go in the control room. And who walks in but uh, Mel Brooks? You know Mel Brooks? Yeah. 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 And we do, a call, uh, we do a demo of a song called Jews in Space which later went into a movie called Spaceballs. But it's like, and that took an hour or something. And then there was stuff. But when you were in the commercial studio business, you never knew what was going to happen. You never knew who was going to be. Oh, tomorrow you're doing uh, Roy Buchanan and Stanley Clark. Crazy stuff. That's amazing. That, so that, that's really interesting because, yeah, you would have had, I mean, if you were just the engineer, you, you must have only been handling the engineering side of it. And I'm, I'm assuming that there was someone the front desk kind of it was working on getting the leads and bringing in those sales or, or was it just like, was it just, that was the industry. It was just like, so that industry was at the time was just so booming that like there was, you know, was there limited studios, for, limited options for people to go to, or was it just, there was that much talent out there that it was always good talent. First of all, put it in perspective. So in uh, New York city in uh, let's say 1975, there were probably 50 studios, a half a dozen really big ones. So if you wanted to make a record, Joe Blow wants to make a record, you have to go to one of those studios. And so just to book time, you have to have credit rating. You have to have the money to do it. You're talking about eh, $175, $250 an hour to make a record. Later, when we got MIDI and all that stuff, we got what we call the democratization of music. Well, we didn't have that in the 70s and early 80s. It was pretty much whatever Tommy Matola and uh, uh, I'll think of it in a minute. But anyway, they, it all had to filter through the record companies. 
you know, it, but largely there were very few. The only people who made their own independent records, well, I mean, it was Todd Rundgren, but where you do vanity records, where there would be some orthodontist from Richmond who would come in and have a hundred thousand dollars, and they would they would make a, a record. Gotcha. Morris Levy, he was the guy. I remember him. Yeah, he had you know Dinah Washington and Roulette Records and all that stuff. He was a complete criminal, one of the great criminals of the industry. <laughs> There's lots, but of it was it was filtered through you know Morris Levy and Tommy Matola and those guys. Yeah, that's amazing. Yeah, I mean, it's just when you look at the the music from that era and and the fact that you got to work with so many of those artists, it yeah, that's very impressive. So moving on, like you eventually started getting into it, well, it sounded like you already had a. a a bit of a background in electronics, right? Is that, no. that that's no, you didn't. Okay. So when you got that API spec that you mentioned, what inspired that? Like what, was that just something they gave you and you were like, Oh, I'll learn I'll learn this stuff or. Well, I looked at the, first of all, it, it, I had been in enough studios to see what was going on. Like for instance, Regent sound, where we did our first, uh, first album or in Mercury, they were ba basically not much more than broadcast mixers. And you were in Merc Mercury. When we started off, we were in three tracks. In uh, the entire first album, we didn't get more than four track. Then I think maybe on the second track, second record, we, they got eight track or maybe the third record. So we were progressing through from very simple setups to more and more complex. Mercifully, I didn't have to learn everything at once like the kids do now. I was able to start with it. Sound ideas. We started off an eight track with 16 inputs and an EMT and uh, two other reverbs and a couple of limiters and couple of mics. So it was pretty simple. You can work your way up. But now, it's, you know, it's much more complicated, especially mm -hmm. with digital. But I had no, no electronics background whatsoever. And the reason that I got the, the little bit of electronics background that I have now is that unlike A&R, which was a big studio, Phil Ramone's place, and some of the other big ones, we had no maintenance man. And so I had to learn enough to keep a session going. I mean, if something broke on a session or if the console would not, I had to figure it out because it was either that or you go home. Gotcha. So I, I bought, uh, back in the day, those army electronics manuals from the Bureau of Printing and Engraving, and, you know, 25 cents for transistors and 50 cents for tubes, whatever it was. And I used to, I commuted from New York City and I had an hour and a half each way on the bus to read this stuff. And so I got to, I learned a little bit about it. I'd say so because eventually you, you started your own production line of, of preamps and compressors and stuff like that. So obviously you knew enough to to get into that that world. How did that come about? Like you now commercially release, you sell your own like preamps and compressors, and they sound great, um, and they're all over the place. And you've got consoles that you build as well. You know how did how did that come about? And and you know with so much amazing gear out there already, like what made you decide to start building your own equipment? Well, there wasn't any amazing gear out there already. See, when I started, uh, let's say 1988 was about the time when MIDI really started catching on. And I think maybe 89, 90, then you got Digital Performer. And then there was, uh, Pro Tools was called Sound Designer, and it was only four tracks and yada, yada. So anyway, a lot of the guys that we worked with, especially in the jingle business, were producing, writing songs and producing tracks at home. A lot of them on this thing, called an Akai 12 track, which was a combination uh, console and recorder on VHS tape. And it sounded pretty bad and that Mike Priest were bad. So they, they would come to me and they say, well, what can we buy to make our stuff sound better? At the time, about the only outboard Mike Pre you could buy was API and I think Demeter. Neve would not sell you anything. Mm -hmm. Because they said, we don't sell parts. We only sell consoles. So we sit with some guys one night. We said, well, what's the best console you ever heard? And they said, well, we think the best console we've ever heard is the Trident A-Range. So I called up my friend Phil Wagner, who was the at the time the president of Trident USA. And I said, why don't you make these A-Range modules again? You know, he said, they have no interest in doing that. They want to build this vector console, which is the thing that put them out of business. They just want to do this computerized stuff. They have no interest. He said, why don't you do it? So he sold me the schematic for the A-Range module for 50 bucks. Wow. And I went off and I went. That's amazing. Yeah. So at the time, was it just that, was your intention just to build enough for like a couple guys here and there? And then it just blew no, no, up? No, I wanted to be a millionaire. 
I thought I was going to sell a thousand of these things a year. I couldn't tell you how wrong I was. The other thing was I, I borrowed a, an A-range module from Lenny Kravitz studio. And I was able to uh, really intensely uh, figure out what was going on and measure the inductors and all that kind of stuff that they were using. Gotcha. So that's what I did. And it evolved from being the mic pre EQ to the mic pre four. No, the next thing was the compressor. That was my design. The FET, what we call the FET two of the old nine one five seven nine. That was my design. And then we did the mic pre four. And then in 2000, I started making the original series consoles. And then we did the FET three. And then now we have a bunch of other things. And now we have a new console. So, and the, and the console thing is what has went, went to sleep during COVID, but it seems to be waking up. It's, it's interesting because. You, you made it sound like you started building these preamps to help the people that were in the home studios and doing their own thing. And now going to the console route, it's kind of like going backwards a little bit, right? Or like the bigger, bigger uh, footprint studios and, and all that, right? Still home studios. Still home studios. I've only, I've only ever sold one console to an actual recording studio. Recording studios don't have any money. It, it largely goes to... Um, people who are recording at home and know better and uh, have the money to do it. I I think our biggest customers are men in their late forties, middle fifties. They always played music, but they went off and did something else. And now they got a bunch of money and they're building a house somewhere and they put a studio in it. There's a lot of that. Good market. Well, it's a small market. Yeah, it's a smaller market, but there's definitely people in there that, that it would work for. Well, I, I'm, I've had a customer for a console. He was a PR guy in Chicago. He had, had three or four hundred thousand dollars worth of guitars in his wow. basement. I mean, there, you know, listen. Some people, people have hobbies. Some people have a sailboat. Some people have motorcycles. Some people have Hasselblads, and some people have recording studios. But by and large, rich people want to be in entertainment. Largely, I've found they open restaurants, which are entertainment. They invest in a Broadway show. They build a recording studio. They do something like that. Very interesting, but but also very true. There's there's some there's some sort of uh, psyche thing in the in there. I mean, how many rich dentists do you know who built a restaurant downtown? It's true. You know? <laughs> yeah. Well, that's interesting because I've seen in a bunch of the documentation that you have for your products, I've seen a lot of mention of the idea of building gear that works for the home studio market. Um, and I'm wondering, like, how exactly would you define the differences between gear that is meant for home studio versus that large format analog console studio? Dollars. You know, there's a lot of cheap stuff. Somebody, went at John and Yellow once asked me, what's the difference between a $100 preamp and a $1,000 preamp? And I said, $900. <laughs> there's a lot of cheap stuff out there, and people think they're, um, they're going to do well by buying it. There's an old saying. Uh, carpenters will say, I'm too poor to afford cheap tools. If that makes any sense to you. Because you buy them over and over again. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So the fundamental of my design, besides sounding good, is to make it easy. I don't want anything that's complicated. I want, my motto is get home early. Uh, I don't want anything that has, you know, mic pre's that have variable transformer impedances and this and that and other thing. I want to be able to plug the stuff in, have it sound better, and go uh, into whatever you're recording to. Pretty simple, really. I love that. A lot of people o- overthink it. It's very true. There, there's something to be said for just like creating efficiencies. And if your gear is, I mean, your gear often is a big part of that efficiency system that you can create. So if you have good stuff that gets the job done, use and it. And it shouldn't get it shouldn't get in the way. You don't want anything that gets in the way. You know, like. Too many microphones, too many choices, too many preamps. That, that's my other gripe. Oh, I have 12 different preamps because I want a color palette. Bullshit. That's <laughs> nothing but a waste of time. You want to sit down and make records. Get I don't care whether it's an API or one of mine or a Neve or a needs a tech. All the preamps should be the same. You don't want to go halfway around the drums and change preamps. You know, it just makes everything take longer. And Clearly, consoles are the most efficient way to record. For sure. You know, it's straight line. You have all the same thing for every channel. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. So in your opinion, then, with, you know, on that idea of different preamps or different color, like, there's obviously lots of differences of opinions. But 
In your opinion, what ultimately makes a great preamp then to you? Well, first of all, in my humble opinion, it has to have a transformer. If it, to me, if it doesn't have an input transformer, then you're really on shaky ground right away. And for people who might not understand what a transformer is, could you give us like the Cole's notes on that? Well, a transformer is a magnetic device that converts one voltage into another. But the other thing that it does is it provides a, spe a specific termination. What that means is if you have a really good microphone, let's say you have some expensive tube microphone with an output transformer in it. It wants to look into a specific termination. If it doesn't look into that, then it doesn't sound the same. If you take a microphone that's designed to look into 12, 1500 ohms and you put it into 10,000 ohms or 600 ohms, you got a different microphone. So you want the, you want that to be consistent. And the other thing is one of the things that people do wrong, even with transformers is that they make it so that when you put the pad in, the reflected impedance changes. People will say, well, I don't like to put the pad on my, on my mic because it sounds different. Well, that may be true because they may be using a preamp where when you put the pad in, instead of being 1500 ohms, it's 4,000 ohms or 600 ohms. And that will change the sound of the microphone. Now, modern cheap microphones are almost all transformer less and have a very low impedance. So they won't care. They don't necessarily care what the reflected impedance is. But when you're working in professional stuff, it's it all has to be very consistent. So we use Jensen transformers. Gotcha. Gotcha. So so in your opinion, any would it be like just any preamp that has a transformer in it is a good enough preamp? Or are there other It's a start. Okay. I mean, it could be a cheap Chinese transformer that sounds like crap, but Gotcha. And and there are quite honestly, there are some many mic pre's that are transformer less. George Massenberg, um, what's his name? My friend in California. Uh, can't think of it off the name, the name of his company. But anyway, they just have no character. Transformers, even if they're um, very linear, tend to impart some character. Gotcha. If, even if they're allegedly flat, they give it a little vibe, which I like. And plus the fact that they gal you have what's called galvanic isolation, which means you're not actually connected to the outside world. So you don't have, you have much less chance of hum and buzz and interference. And mm -hmm. So, so then I know like there's a lot of talk about, like, I feel like when people look at like the hierarchy of the signal chain, like where, where do you rate the, the preamp then? Is that, is that up there as one of the top things in your signal chain? The microphone and the preamp, you know, yeah, you can't polish a turd. You know, you have to have a, a decent microphone. You don't need a lot of different microphones either. And uh, you need a good preamp match to it. You know, um, for instance, I'm not a fan of SM57s. Never used one, never owned one, don't like them. But then a lot of people do. Mm -hmm. It's very, uh, very opinion driven. To me, a guitar should always be recorded with a large diaphragm condenser microphone that has a, is a FET microphone. That right there is the secret to that. Not a tube, but a FET. And is that just because of you just prefer those microphones or you prefer the way those microphones? I guess your, your point is that you should always be pairing the microphone with the right preamp for that, for that mic, essentially. The, the preamp is a whole other thing. But, you know, uh, you know if, if you have even some very inexpensive um, Audio-Technica microphones, they make some pretty good. But you don't have to have a U67 or something fancy like that, or U8, you know, U87. So then, when when people are buying microphone preamps, like another another thing that I often see is people will say things like Class A or Class B, or whatever. What what exactly does that mean, and why is that important to someone who's buying a preamp? Okay, Class A is kind of a buzzword. In the nuts nuts of it, anything that uses an op amp. That's a broad statement, but largely any amp thing that uses an op amp, an operational amplifier, runs on bipolar something, usually 15, maybe 16, bipolar 24. Where the signal passes through the zero point, which is in the middle, you get what's called crossover distortion. In a class A amplifier, they don't run on bipolar power. They run on a, a voltage at the top and zero at the bottom. Our stuff starts out at 48. Most of it runs at about 38 volts and then zero. So there's no crossover distortion because you don't have it. Class A stuff tends to draw a little more current because the signal is always on. It's not being turned on. The amplifier is always on. It's not being turned on by the input signal. 
Gotcha. It's kind of complicated, but basically that's it. Well, Neve, yeah. Neve is single-ended. All the old Neve stuff is single-ended. That runs in 24 volts. Our stuff starts out at 48 because that's we use, also use it for Phantom. Uh, the old Trident stuff was single-ended. Uh, Helios, all that, all that kind of stuff. API was always bipolar. MCI is bipolar, op amps. So if you're, so would you say that um, because you're not getting that crossover distortion, generally the signal with a Class A microphone preamp is going to just be cleaner in general? Can be. A lot of people are able to get the crossover distortion out of, of bipolar op amps, but it's... Yeah, you just got to drive it a lot harder to get that saturation out of it, I guess, right? I, I don't think saturation is where the crossover distortion comes. Saturation can come from a couple of things. You can overload the transformer, which is probably a better way to do it than... Um, Overloading the preamp. Gotcha. And when you say saturation, there are many things you could saturate. I guess, that, yeah, that's a good way to look at it. Because because then, yeah, a lot of preamps have an input and an output. So when you crank the input, is that, that's, correct me if I'm wrong, but that's saturating in the in the uh, transformer, right? No. No? Okay. When you crank up the input, you're that largely that's feedback in the first amplifier. So uh, uh, that that's where you're saturating the amplifier. I mean, if you're putting a level into the transformer that the transformer can tolerate, and then you want to saturate something, then you turn the preamp up and then you turn the output down. If you want the transformer to saturate, then you'll want to have some kind of microphone that has a very high level output and you won't put the pad on. And then you'll saturate the transformer probably and the preamp. Gotcha. Okay. No, that, that's a great way of putting it. And I think anyone who's trying to, to hear the differences between those different areas of saturation, that, that's that's a good way to test all of that and, and actually hear what what the results would be. That's great. Um, I'd also love to talk about compressors because I know that you have also built a bunch of compressors. Um, so in your opinion, what is it about different models of compressors that people, sh- like what is it that people should be looking out for when trying to determine which compressors to use? Okay, so when I made my first compressor, I you know what a Ben Franklin is when you make a list of all the things that are good and bad? Yep. I made a list of all the things that people like, and I took all those compressors. You know, you take a Fairchild, you take an LA-2A, you take a 1176, you take, the, you take all the compressors that people like, and then you take all the ones that people don't like. And in the ones that people like, there are some characteristics that are always the same. They're always feedback. Now, feedback is a little... Weird little thing. So imagine this. The signal comes into the compressor, and then it goes through whatever the gain change element is. Now, the gain hasn't been changed yet. And then it comes out of the gain change element, and it goes to an amplifier. Then, after that, the signal comes out and goes back into the gain change element, which is, in theory, is backwards, right? Because you're Attempting to change the gain after it's always been already been through maybe a half cycle, but that's what works. That's what's called feedback or hysteresis. Then there's the other style. Okay, the next thing is they want a peak detector, a peak detector as opposed to an RMS detector. You'll see a lot of compressors say they have RMS detectors. Nobody likes that. Then the other thing is you want to have a discrete amplifier at the output of the unit. Okay, now what do people not like? They don't like feed forward. If you look at the data sheet for any company that makes VCAs, for instance, and you say, and they'll all have a data sheet that says, this is how you make a compressor. They're always sampling the signal before the gain change element, which is called feed forward. They're almost always RMS detectors. And the other, and this is why VCA has got a bad rap. The other thing about a VCA, unlike other amplifiers, is that it does not have voltage output. It has current output, which means it has to go into a little amplifier to convert the current into voltage. It's exactly the same as a summing bus. Now, most of those VCAs within the VCA have a shitty little op amp that does that conversion. So right away, you're using feed forward, using RMS, and using a crappy little op amp to convert it back to voltage. It's a lose, lose, lose right there. Now, our first two compressors were all FET compressors. FET compressors are much more complicated to build. They sound great. Um, the FET is very temperature unstable. So if you put a FET compressor next to something that generates a lot of heat, it doesn't have to go up but a few degrees for it to drift off 2 or 3 dB. So they're temperature sensitive, and they don't. They have a very limited range in how much compression they can do, maybe 25 dB. 
so we made the original mono one. Now we make a stereo one. Now we make a stereo VCA compressor. And that compressor, and this is, this goes for the one in the console also is set up like a FET compressor where it's feedback. It has a peak detector and it has a discrete amplifier after the VCA to convert the current to voltage. And that's, that's what we do now. And that's for a lot of reasons because A, they're not temperature sensitive. They will be able to, they can shut off 60 dB. And the other thing is that the FETs that we use in our compressors have been obsolete for about 20 years. And about 10 years ago, I bought, I don't know, seven or 10,000 of them and keep them in inventory because you can't get them anymore. So the, um, the future for Fed compressor compressors in any volume is dim because you just can't get the FETs any longer. There's only one FET that ever really worked out in audio, and uh, and I have 10,000 of them if anybody wants them. <laughs> uh, but anyway, so we do it in VCAs now, we make, and it beca- behaves like a FET compressor. Very cool. So for people who might not understand the differences in, in VCA, FET, like opto, tube, like those things, like how would you describe the sonic, sonic differences between them then? Obviously, there, there is a technical element to how they're made, and that, that contributes to the sound. But Okay, one of the most important things that affects the sound in a compressor is the side chain. And that determines how quickly the compressor can attack and how it releases. Now, in the case of an optical compressor, especially the older ones that have a lamp in them, that's sort of predetermined because the lamp has a warm-up time and then it has a, a cool-off time. So the attack and release, like in a, in a true LA two-A, is determined by the lamp itself. Now, the lots of modern ones use an LED, which is faster than they have to put a time constant around them. But that's how that one works. But it's largely in the side chain. How the compressor thinks about the signal that came in and what it decides it's going to do with, uh, about it. And like what it's analyzing, basically. Well, it says, I got this signal. What do I want to do with this? Uh, I think I want to limit it in, um, I don't know, 200 milliseconds or 30 milliseconds or whatever. And then what I'm going to do? Well, let's see. It's a simple one, so I'll just let it go after, I don't know, 100 milliseconds. No, that was kind of loud. Maybe I should let that one h- hang for a little longer. See, that's what I call about variable time constants. Ours always have a setting in the release, what I call the auto, where the release is not fixed. It's dependent on how loud the level was and how long it was there, if that makes gotcha. any sense. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. The fast one is just one thing. It just goes up and it goes down. But the auto, it goes, hmm, I wonder what we should do about that. It's like actually analyzing and thinking about what to do. <laughs> sort of. Yeah, yeah, sort of. <laughs> it's a capacitive network, but it's, yes. I do the thinking, it does the work. Fair. <laughs> so then as far as like sonic character between effect compressor or VCA or tube, like how would you describe like the, the tonal differences between them? Well, okay, so let's take a Fairchild, which everybody wants. It has giant transformers, it's tubes, and it has a very interesting side chain, so that's one sound. Uh, the 1176, never a device I was ever interested in. I don't, I don't like the 1176. It's got a really ratty uh, output amplifier. And, uh, you know, it's funny because when I started at Sound Ideas, we had an original pair of LA 2 ways and uh, – for what, actually, for a space consideration, George sold the LA-2As and he put in LA-3As, which are essentially the same thing, only half the size in their transistor. Mm-hmm. And they sounded like crap. Those things that, I don't know what that amplifier was in the LA-3A, but it was not, it was like one day we should, we went from having U67s and LA-2As to U87s and LA-3As. It was like, what the hell happened? <laughs> so the output amplifier has something to do with it, the transformer. Um, but largely, the gain change element has something to do with it. Like the Neve uh, 33609, that's a diode bridge. That's some thing where they're making the voltage drop over diodes and then bringing the gain back up. That's one way. That's a pretty clean way of doing it. Well, I mean, those are the basic ones, right? You have yeah, opto, yeah, yeah. FET, um, tube, tubes. And uh, VCA. No, um, the one I just said, diode bridge. Cool. Yeah, because because I feel like I mean, you know, people, you know, people are looking at uh, all these different 
compressors. I mean, most of the people listening to this are probably using plug-in emulations of these things, but you have all these different options, and it's, it, it is important to understand the differences in the different design types so that you know how it's going to react to your signal and you know, ultimately change the sound, right? Compression is one of the things that the DAWs do not do well. It uh, just doesn't work out. Uh, EQ, eh, sort of, which is why um, it's very hard to sell equalizers these days because people think, oh, I'll just do it in the, in the box. But compression in the box is really not good. And why do you think that is? Um, I don't know enough about the way it does it, but I think largely, even though they say it isn't, I think it's done feed forward. I don't know why. I could just tell you that it doesn't sound like much. And if you really want good compression, you do it outside the box. Gotcha. It's interesting because there are some models of compressors. I, I, I'm thinking of like the APIs that actually have a switch that allows you to go from feed forward and feed back, correct? We actually can do that in our new console too. Very cool. And the, those APIs that you're talking about have RVCAs. In our console, presently, the feed forward version is much more aggressive. And uh, it's probably the most aggressive mode we have. And it's almost like a ducker. So if you want to do drums or something like that, you can really pound the crap out of them. Very cool. If I'm just sitting down and doing a vocal or guitars or something, I'm going to use feedback. Gotcha. Gotcha. Well, yeah, let's talk about the console a little bit more because that's definitely something that you guys are working on these days and, and, and putting out a lot more of them. And it's obviously a, it's a, a cumulation, cumulation, cumulation. I can't remember the word there. Culm it's, it's, culmination. That's culmination the word. of, there you go. Thank you. Culmination of all of your work over the years, you know, building the preamps, building the compressors and EQs and putting it all into one large format uh, device. So, um, yeah, tell us a little bit about those, those consoles and, and, you know, what they include and what, what people might be using them for. So the console has the same mic pre we've always had, the same uh, VCA compressor that we're using now, the same four band EQ that we've always had. So the console is kind of interesting in that it has two basic configurations. Mm -hmm. In its basic configuration, it is a legacy console where the signal comes into the mic pre, goes into the compressor, goes into the EQ, insert send, insert return, fader, out to the buses, three or four signals together, you know, like the drums, and you put them on track one, which of course is not how anybody records now. So then we have another mode where you press two buttons and you get mic pre, compressor, EQ, insert send, insert return, direct to your recorder. Then the recorder comes back on the large faders and the recorder drives the buses. And so then the buses are stereo, you got the aux ends, and with the multi-track buses, largely people use that to drive personal cue. You know, you got, we have a, cue, a full cue system, but you can say, well, let's put the, the, the stereo mix in the cue and then I'll put, you know, the drums on one and the bass on two and, and that sort of thing. And, uh, then you can have, you know, it's easy to do more of me in the cue. That's very cool. That's a smart way of, smart way of doing it. It's like kind of just a modern take on a console then. So we have uh, a typical console has 16 inputs and then it has eight returns, which we would call effects returns, but essentially they're identical to the inputs, except they don't have the mic pre-compression and EQ. They have all the same routing. And then there's an eight way mixer, which is just for mixing stems. It's another eight points to get into the stereo bus. And then each module input module actually has three inputs. It has mic line and monitor. And in that mode, we were just talking about the, your recorder return is coming back on the monitor input. But you can push a button and it will send the monitor to the five, six aux ends. And so you now have a separate mixer, so to speak, a separate stereo mixer. And then that five, six individually by each channel can be sent up to the multi tracks. And so it could go off the five, six bus and go up to the multi-track so you can do stems. So in theory, a, uh, a 16 input in remix, 16 on the main faders, 16 on the auxes, 16, 16 separate, uh, signals there, 32, eight on the returns and five, six has to come back somewhere. So you get to use six more on the, uh, the mixer, so you you can literally mix forty six separate inputs on remix. Wow, on a sixteen, and 
that goes up, of course, exponentially at 32, which is 32, 64, uh, 72, and 680. Wow. And that's awesome. everything is balanced too, by the way. None of this is some funky little unbalanced input or anything like that. Yeah. Everything is balanced in and out. It sounds like you've obviously built it for kind of this this digital era of people working in the box and then setting stuff back to a console and summing it through there. Um, are there any features as far as like uh, automation with the faders or anything like that? Or is it just... Yeah, well, uh, we have an automation system we've been working on. We haven't actually implemented it yet. There, there are many there are automation systems. The fader bays will accept virtually anything from one of the Carl Malone systems to... Uh, to flying faders to GML, if you get an old one, whatever. There's plenty of room in there to put any kind of a fader system in it. Cool. That's awesome. Yeah, I imagine that's something that people would definitely find helpful to have that kind of integrated with their DAW even more. The automation system is controlled by the DAW, but it does moving faders. And so it can work in two different ways. It can uh, control the audio within Pro Tools operate the VCS or whatever it is within Pro Tools, or it can uh, put the audio in the fader, or it can do a little bit of both. Our faders have a, a switch. Uh, you know, it's funny. I was, uh, I called up Joe Ciccarelli one time and said, can I come by? And he says, sure, because the assistant is zeroing the faders. So, so I get there. The, guy, the producer had done a mix on a laptop on an airplane or something. And he had it all broken out into stems. And so, he, they have to then take the line inputs and zero them all out. Well, that means they're taking a tone and putting the thing and moving the fader and all that. So I said, that's silly. So then after that, uh, we put a switch on the faders, which bypasses the fader. There's a calibration screw. They're set to unity gain that direct out. So then you can just flip the switches and take your Pro Tools mix and let's say it's 16 stems and reliably get the same thing, but with analog summing. That's amazing. And then if you want to have a little EQ or compression or something like that or add some effects, you can do it. And then if you want to just change one level quickly, you just flip the switch and move the fader. Very interesting. So, yeah, people would still technically have to zero out the EQ points that people have already kind of roughed in. But but as far as like fader level, that that would automatically go to zero. Yeah, well, I, uh, assuming that the EQ, you're going to use the EQ that's in the, yeah. the DAW, and then if you want to add a little extra. Gotcha, know. gotcha. I see what you're saying. Yeah. That's very cool. Very cool. Well, speaking of EQ, I, I noticed that like with a lot of your units, you tend to use stepped EQ points. And I was just wondering, like, is that a decision that's based off of like technical design limitations for like the size of what you're building? Or is that just a preference that you have as far as stepped versus like having a total sweepable parametric EQ? Well, it's sort of the opposite of a design limitation. Okay. Because in this case, each frequency is a tuned filter that does a specific thing. When you take a parametric EQ, probably somewhere in the sweep, it's pretty good. And the rest of it is just uh, some compromise. It's not tuned for any of those other frequencies. You know, it's just kind of sweeping across of some... That's why parametric... I don't think parametric EQs are sound very good. You know, I, w- I would rather have an EQ that you land on 3K, you know what it's going to do, and you know what it sounds like. Every one of those things is individually tuned. Gotcha. And and with stepped EQ, like because I obviously the the parametric EQ, the advantage is that you can change like the the bandwidth and the Q settings. With with the stepped, is it that's what proportional? Was the, what was the motto? You you've drifted away from the motto. Get home early. Yeah, get home early. Yeah, that's right. Oh, I think I'm going to go and change the cue on the top. You know, it's come on. <laughs> you, you've broken the cardinal rule. I love it. No, that that that's that's a great example of of you implementing that motto into your to your work. Yeah, I love that. Yeah, and obviously, like I mean, you. I guess one of one of the other advantages is that you are an engineer. You have that background in recording as well. So you you've worked with these frequencies. You know what you like and your settings are. So you know it's not, it's not just like some somebody who's building this technically who doesn't actually implement this stuff or actually actually use the equipment. Like you're someone who's coming into it with a musical ear. Okay, I, it is a question. How many people do you know who actually build audio equipment who have ever used it? I would like to think a lot of them, but I'm okay. I'm a, okay, who? <laughs> Fair. Did Rupert, Rupert, Rupert Neve make records? No. Massenburg makes records. Yeah. Uh, I make records, but does John LeGru make records? I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> they're, they're very 
few to none people who have ever been in the commercial studio business who actually make gear. That 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 makes a lot of sense. That like, yeah, you're you're, you're good at making people trust you, man. <laughs> what can I tell you? No, that, that definitely. Well, you, know, you like it or you don't. You know, I mean, it's true. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> maybe you just don't like it. That's possible too. <laughs> Well, another speaking of EQ and, and and another thing that you've implemented into your into your gear that I wanted to ask you about was um, your high pass filters. And I know that you've implemented high pass filters that are sweepable up to usually about two hundred hertz. And I was curious to get your opinion. Like I, I hear a lot of people say that like in general people should high pass everything except for their kick and bass tracks. And I'm just wondering what your thoughts are on that philosophy. Um, essentially, yes. Uh, but if you if let's go back to studio days. So you're in a big studio. It's probably well-designed. It probably has good isolation. You're listening on big speakers, so you can hear the low end. And you're recording to 30 IPS tape. 30 IPS tape doesn't have anything below 40 hertz. It just rolls right off, drops off like a canyon. So you're pretty well protected. Now, kids at home, they're recording with some large diaphragm microphone in a bedroom. You got UPS trucks driving by. They're working on little speakers where they can't hear anything, plus the fact that the neighbors will kill them if they can. And the DAW will record 10 hertz. What could possibly go wrong? So this is where I I started off on the Mic Pre 1. I've always had a high high pass filter, but it was just a fixed frequency. But on the Mic Pre 1, I said, this unit is designed for the home user who has one microphone. I said, what can I do to make it easier for them? High pass filter. You get you get a, a a woman in there singing, and you turn that thing up until you feel it, and then you just crack it back a little bit. Because in digital, you can accumulate a tremendous amount of low frequency energy on tracks, all of which takes up room and processing, and uh, there's no point in it. You just want to get rid of it. So I always use the high pass on my consoles. When I was engineering um, all the time, I used the high pass filter all the time. There's no, there's no point in recording, you know, 20 hertz on a vocal. What are you, what are you getting? Foot shuffling and the mic stand rattling? Uh, so, yes, use it all the time and until you feel it. Even on a bass drum, you know, maybe you want to touch it because if you want a bass drum to sound like it was recorded on tape, then you need to take a little bit of that really low stuff out. Gotcha. That, that's a great tip. Because, yeah, I, th- I think that a lot of people forget the fact that, yeah, they're just recording in a different environment with different equipment than what a lot of this classic equipment was built for. Yeah. I mean, if you listen to really, really good sounding records, um, you know, almost all of them were recorded on tape. And you listen to the drum sounds. Like one of my favorite bass drum sounds is one that Ed Cherney did with, uh, Bonnie Raitt, that uh, that album he did where the Nick of Time and those things. Listen to the quality of the recording on that. It's it's really really good. If you want to sample a bass drum, that's where that's where to steal it. Yeah, I'll have to, I'll have to check it out. <laughs> Although people shouldn't be stealing, we'll, we'll stress that. No, no, but yeah, should no, yeah for sure. Um, last last question that I want to ask you is that I, there's a common expression that I hear a lot of engineers use these days and it's and it's basically it's about the ear not the gear and as someone who is an engineer who also builds gear I'm curious to get your thoughts on that okay so you can make terrific records on terrible equipment and it's been done over and over uh, because the most important thing is the song and the performance so the the equipment really shouldn't make any difference it makes it easier if it's good you know it's uh you don't have to wrestle with it so much but the other thing i want to say is use your ears and not your eyes because one of the things and i say this over and over is that i think the daw is a terrible recorder it's a great mixer great post-production tool but it's what i call the bitchy girlfriend that always wants attention you're always looking at that instead of the instead of the artist or watching on what's going on in the studio. And then you'll, you'll, you know, you'll dial in some EQ curve and you'll, then you'll look at it in Pro Tools and you go, Oh, that can't be right. Look at those weird things. And you'll straighten it out. You know, it's not something that you should be paying attention to. You should just have the thing set up for levels, metering on the console and off you go. 
and watching what the singer is doing, watching what's going on in the studio. It makes me crazy when people just stare into the screen. It's almost like all plugins should have like a dark mode where like as soon as you start to adjust the, the knobs, the screen goes black. Like <laughs> that'd be brilliant. <laughs> Oh, you mean so you'd actually have to listen to yeah, what it's exactly, doing? Yeah, exactly, right? <laughs> yeah, because you look at it and go, well, that curve looks good. That must sound good. Yeah. Like, no. <laughs> Especially at EQ curves. You can come up with some really wacky EQ curves with a with an EQ, and then you'll look at it and you go, oh, that can't be right. Yeah. You know, and then you'll fix it. Fix it to to visually look good, but no one will ever see what that EQ graph looked like or and even it probably, care. So- probably sounds worse. Yeah, exactly. You know, um, I've often said this and nobody wants to hear it, but I think one of the best digital recorders is radar. Give that to the Canadians, right? Yeah. Because yeah. it, it works like a tape machine. It doesn't require any, it doesn't, you can look at it if you want to, but it doesn't require any looking at it. You do that. And then, of course, the later versions of radar had Pro Tools built in. So then you go and you flip it into Pro Tools and you got all the Pro Tools stuff. But the fact that you have to look at the DAWR recording is the most irritating thing to me. That's, that's definitely a, a really good point. And yeah, something that people should all, all pay attention to. Um, because yeah. You record I mean, with your eye, with your ears and not your eyes. Yeah, what is it? Engineers, not engine eyes or something like that? Oh, that's, that's a good one. Yeah. <laughs> Never heard of that one. Yeah. <laughs> well, Jeff, thank you so much for taking the time to to come on here today. And and I just think that all of the information you gave here just really puts things into perspective as for in terms of like what to be listening for or what to be thinking about when selecting gear and um, just giving us that technical knowledge, I think I think is super helpful and will help a lot of people with their home production. So so I wanted to just say thank you for, for taking the time. If anyone who if there's anyone who wants to learn more about you or or your products online, what's the best place for them to do that? Daking.com, D-A-K-I-N-G.com. Amazing. Well, we'll and tell the kids all to buy consoles next year. Of course. I'll put it in the show notes. We'll tell everyone, buy a console. Here's a link. <laughs> Here's a link. Yeah. <laughs> we have financing on there, the whole thing. Just get it. Just throw out all that crap that you bought over the years and put it all in one pile of money and buy a console. You'll, you'll make your life easy. Love it. <laughs> all right. Well, I'll definitely add links in the show notes for everyone to to keep to, to, to Go to your website, check it out, and buy a console. So that was my interview with Jeff Daking, and that was a great interview. I love the perspective that he gave of building gear that is meant for home studio use versus working in larger format analog studios using a ton of gear that most home studio engineers don't have. And I just love that he's building a lot of efficiencies into the gear that he creates. And I think that when you hear him talk about his motto of get home by five, and when you look at the features that he's built into his equipment, you can really see the correlation there. And I just think that it's a refreshing take on building equipment that doesn't just sound good, but actually creates efficiencies in the studio. And uh, yeah, I just, I just really love the Dickin gear. It sounds amazing. So you should definitely check it out. So Jeff, if you're listening to this, thank you so much for taking the time to be on here. And for you, the listener, make sure to subscribe to this podcast on whatever podcast platform you like. That way you're notified about all new episodes as they go live. They go live on Wednesday mornings. So you definitely don't want to miss out. We've got tons of great interviews scheduled coming up. So definitely make sure to subscribe. That way you don't miss out. And also make sure to visit MasterYourMix.com. That is a website where I help musicians with creating pro sounding recordings from their home studios. And we make the process of recording, editing, and mixing your music easy. And one of the things you're going to want to check out on the website is a book called The Mixing Mindset. This is an Amazon number one bestselling book that I created a few years ago. And inside of that book, we really break down the process of mixing from beginning to end, helping you identify what to do, when to do it, what to listen out for, how to dial in settings with your EQ, compression, effects, automation, and so much more. I really make this process super simple for you. So definitely make sure to check this out. It's called The Mixing Mindset, and it's available at MasterYourMix.com. So that is it for this episode, guys. Thank you so much for sticking around to the very end, and I can't wait to talk to you in the next one. We'll talk soon. Take care. Thanks for listening to the Master Your Mix podcast. To have your questions answered, submit your questions to questions at masteryourmix.com. Please go to iTunes and subscribe and leave a review. And for more information on how you can improve your mixes, visit masteryourmix.com.